When people feel like they don't belong, it is a way to prevent them from voting. We are, in fact, two different countries. One country where you have people who are trying to include those who have been traditionally excluded, and then another country that's trying to exclude them so that they can win. What is this Americanness that we have never seen in this country before, which is a multiracial democracy based on equality? Okay, we haven't seen that. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Look. The Brennan Center for Justice, who tracks such things, reported at the end of last year that in 2021, at least 19 states passed 34 laws restricting access to voting and more than 440 such bills were introduced in 49 states. That's almost all of them. Moving into 2022, just days after the country marked the birth of the great voting rights crusader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Senate voted to uphold that chamber's most recent filibuster rules, meaning that it was impossible for the majority to pass a new voting rights law. And so it was, that a Freedom to Vote Act, named after King's ally John Lewis, went down to defeat in the same week as the Dr. King holiday. What to make of all of this, especially as viewed from the communities that Lewis and King represented? Today, we welcome our colleagues Sarah Lomax Reese and Mitra Kalita, co founders of URL Media, as we do every month to host our monthly Meet the BIPOC Press Media Roundtables. URL is a network of black and brown owned and operated media outlets that is right now celebrating its one year anniversary. So a big congratulations on that. Sarah, Mitra, take it from here. Thanks, Laura. It's so great to be back for another year and another episode of Meet the BIPOC Press. It's um, great to be here, and it does mark um, one year since URL Media's journey began, so this is an especially um, poignant episode. We have an amazing panel assembled today. Uh, we're going to be talking with Solomon Jones, who is the morning show host of WURD. He's also a journalist and author, and Michelle Garcia, who is a freelance writer for Palabra, which is the digital publication for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Both WURD and Palabra are part of the URL media network. So many people in BIPOC communities feel like this issue of voting rights has already been resolved. It was resolved in the 60s. And yet right now we are really in the fight of our lives. Solomon, I'm gonna start with you because I know you were doing a live broadcast during Martin Luther King Day that you know, was in the center of Philadelphia. And we were talking to a lot of people about this very question. You know, one of the things that that I heard was was from a listener, and I thought the question was so so poignant. And I think it it underscored how people in the community view this whole issue. And the question was, why do we have to keep having laws passed specifically for black people to be able to vote? Um, why do we have to have this reauthorized every 10 years so that black people can vote? And, and what it showed me was the perception in the community that without these laws, black people cannot vote, that, that we have specific laws for us uh, that allow us to vote. People have to understand that um, these laws are designed specifically to, to make it harder for you to vote. Um, but they're not saying black people can't vote. What, what they're doing is, is making it so hard that it discourages you, you from voting and reduces your numbers so that they can win. Um, that's what people are saying. People are angry. People are frustrated. Um, you know, some people are, are saying that they are, um, you know, um, enthusiastic about the future because in the future we'll be able to get these people out with, with another election. But the reality is... Um, People understand that this is targeted toward Black people. They might not understand all of the, all of the details, but they do understand that they're targets, and and it makes them angry. 
I'm wondering, Michelle, because you're in Texas and we know that Texas is one of those states that has some of the most, um, you know, rigorous or, or um, restrictive voting laws that are being enacted. And, and can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing as you're covering uh, Texas for Palabra? Sure. I, I'd like to maybe also pick up from what Solomon just said was something I observed actually in New York that I think rings true across the country. And I certainly see it here in Texas. After the 2016 election, I was on the subway and uh, was going to Harlem where I lived. And this young black man was like teenager starts talking with a woman who I assumed he knew, but didn't. And he just said to her, I was sitting next to him. He said, it just feels like nobody wants black people anymore. Like he just said it. And it was, it was, it was, I shuddered. Mm. And when people feel like they don't belong, and, and, and I wrote a story about this for Palabra uh, and researchers uh, and for the world, um, PRX, the world, when people feel like they don't belong, it is, it is a way to prevent them from voting. So let's start with the cycle that you put restrictions in place you have campaigns with messaging that basically communicates who's important, who's not. And there is a cycle in which people are being told you don't matter. Uh, you don't actually belong. And so one of the, th so before we even get to the ballot box, there is so many obstacles that have to be overcome in order to say, to, to overcome that message of not belonging what that kid felt, what people here felt. And what I've seen personally, I got turned away from the polls myself twice for one election um, because of the voter ID law. Was this so, in Texas, Michelle? In Texas. Um, the next time I voted, I took my voter registration card and my name was on the rolls, but they didn't have the same number. And I was allowed to vote, but I don't know if my vote was counted. I mean, this is after you like, find the place and, and do these things. And add to that, you're listening to the media tell you, the news reports telling you, Texas has been a red state and, that is, and that's unlikely to change. And there you are in your busy day driving along hearing one or the other party has dominated. And so you ask yourself, what's the point? Again, are you gonna go back to the ballot box twice after you get turned away? Are you gonna take time out in those long lines that we already know blacks and Latinos face lines that are twice as long as whites do? These are completely different realities that our American, our fellow Americans are experiencing. When I interview young people though, I will, you know, I wanna end not on a hopeful, I, I don't do hopeful, but um, a sort of more um, another point of view. I am deeply moved by interviewing people in their 20s and 30s, recent college grads, first ones in their family to go to college, and they get in involved politically and they challenge these voter laws and they organize not for themselves, for their parents. I will pick up on one thread of hope, uh, Michelle. And Michelle, you know, I've known each other a long time and I feel like that is our relationship. So um, in here in New York City, um, just days before um, this recent news of um, voting rights being uh, further curbed, New York City decided to extend the ability to vote in municipal elections, so local, not state, not federal, to non-citizens, um, which is really significant. That's almost a million people. It's 800,000 to a million people. And then I think the other trend um, that's noteworthy is that during the pandemic, mail-in ballots became very normalized and the other trend in New York that I think is hopeful is that voting is turning into a bit of a season. So it's days and days as opposed to the one day, which I think because of the lines and you know, some other factors that Michelle mentioned, also confusion on that day itself, um, you know, that gives me a little bit more hope in terms of people being able to invest the time to get to the ballot box. What, what you're painting is uh, an illustration of what the Kerner Commission said back in the 60s, that America was moving towards being two countries, one black, one white, 
uh, one rich, one poor, separate and, and unequal. And, and that's kind of where we are, not only uh, from a material sense, um, but I think also from a political sense. Uh, where you have New York trying to move to include immigrants and to include uh, people who aren't citizens. You have uh, many other parts of the country that are moving to exclude them um, and to exclude black people and to exclude uh, Latinos and young people and anybody else who's not going to vote uh, for what has essentially become a right wing Republican Party. Um, we're not going to change our policies. We we're going to make sure that you can't vote so that you can't vote against these policies. For me, the pandemic and and those mail in ballots kind of came together in my own experience. I was getting over COVID mm -hmm. um, during the uh, November election here in in Philadelphia, and I had a mail in ballot just as I was coming out of uh, quarantine. One of the first things that I was able to do was to take that mail in ballot to a uh, a place where I could do a, a drop off box and avoid this long line that was all that was around the corner. And so I voted, um, you know, using a mail-in ballot because of the pandemic, as I'm coming off of um, COVID quarantine and was able to use that, that was empowering. And the same Republicans here in Pennsylvania that voted to approve those mail-in ballots are now trying to do this election review where they want to get people's uh, social security numbers and addresses and all of this personal information. And I think it's part of an intimidation tactic to try to keep people from voting. Yeah, that's right. And I would add to that, I mean, you look at a place like Texas that is quote unquote majority minority. And I wrote a piece a couple of years ago where I asked the question, what will it take in order for Latinos and Blacks, Na Native Americans and Asians in the state of Texas who now represent the majority to see themselves as a center. Hmm. To see the, you know, when does the conversation change to voters and voters of color to voters of color because we're it, yeah. right? When do the institutions and the coverage and the candidates and the messaging and the funding shift to reflect the reality that we're the voters, we're the American voters, not like, a, a, a parenthetical. And one of the things that, you know, we saw in Texas, for example, is Lina Hidalgo, the Harris County judge, the top administrator, right? Born in Colombia, immigrated to the United States and won, a seat, won this powerful seat. And in the last election, she, and, and, and the county clerk and others made it possible to have 24 hour drive through voting. You could vote anywhere. They opened up so many more places, voting locations. I mean, it was revolutionary for Texas. And the, the, there was such a backlash by Republicans and the governor to shut that down. And the, the voter re voting restriction laws targeted what Harris County had done specifically. Now, what I think gets missed in, in this, when we focus on that kind of dogfight political part, which is important, is that what Lina Hidalgo did and what the electeds in Harris County did and what, how this connects to what's happening to New York is they make us see what is possible. It sort of opens the windows and say, you know, questions, why do we restrict it? Why do we think that it must be done this way? And I think what comes down to, and I interviewed Lina Hidalgo shortly after she was elected, was power versus power and community. I mean, her approach to her office was based in, I'm here to serve the entirety of community. And I think, you know, as overused as that word is, it is a very powerful one because you either have electeds who operate from a sense of inclusiveness, all of us, or those who operate from a sense of some of us. I think that until these political machines recognize the power of our communities, BIPOC, black and brown communities, that they need to be centered and prioritized, then you know they're gonna continue to um, fall short 
in terms of these elections. But I also think that in addition to these laws that are being enacted, there's a very real issue of voter apathy. And mm -hmm. Solomon, you know, in Philadelphia, we've had elections where only like 17% of people have actually come out to vote. How do we make sure people do what they can do to vote, to get out to vote and not sit it out? And so Solomon, I'll punt that to you. I believe that in order for people to uh, do everything that they can to vote, they need to see a win. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, especially among young people, there is um, a cynicism that's that's born of what they've seen. They've seen that things have not changed as quickly as they would like uh, to see them change. Um, they come from a generation where things, technology and everything else moves quickly. Politics does not. I heard what Michelle said earlier about young people, you know, working for their parents in, in the Latino community, in the black community. Um, a lot of our young people are, uh, are feeling like, um, why should I vote? They're feeling disillusioned. I would like to just maybe suggest reconsidering the word apathy um, to neglected. But when you look at the fact that before the elections in, for example, the state of Texas, 40% of Latinos have not been contacted by a campaign or a party. When you look at how the lens through which news media covers the elections, when you look at the fact that so many people feel that the party and the candidates only come around when it is time to vote and they don't see what, you know, as Solomon is talking about, what are the wins along the way? and What are you doing for me? Um, then you're neglected. So the question is, if we want people to vote and we want to reframe the idea of who's an American, right, then what are we asking people to vote for? What is this democracy? What is the unifying uh, progressive or not even progressive, even non-ideological? What is this Americanness that we have never seen in this country before, which is a multiracial democracy based on equality? Okay, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen it for very long. So we need to give it a contour. We need to give it a name and we need to say, you who are willing to go out on the streets and protest or you who feel neglected, this is what you're fighting for when you overcome this. And this unifying message of which we all are all the, occupy the center and not the orbit is what's missing. See, Republicans have that. The conservatives have that. They base it on the original premise of this country which, and its original ideas of exclusion. And I would just add to what Solomon said earlier when mentioning the Kerner Commission. The other point in the Kerner Commission is for so long, the news media has reported this country through the lens of white eyes for white people. What are we going to do to energize, to reframe, to mobilize our communities in this really pivotal time? We cannot change legislation if we do not vote and if we do not get in representation that actually represents the people. Um, and so um, I would encourage people um, to formulate what it is that you want, um, even before you get out in the streets to protest, because if you don't, uh, they'll take down a statue. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll change the name of a building. They'll do stuff that really doesn't matter and doesn't change your reality. And so um, for us to, to, to get these demands, for us to, uh, to to get the change that we need, we must vote. Within the news media, BIPOC media know this story best. And so I would implore mainstream media to pick up the Haitian Times or pick up Epicenter, listen to WURD and those listeners tell you how they're going to vote and how they're feeling. Um, I worry that there's such a disconnect, especially in this moment of the crisis in the pandemic, between what we're seeing on TV and the reality on the ground. And I think BIPOC media is just so uniquely positioned to have those conversations uh, because we're not just interviewing, we're really listening and responding. Michelle. You just talk to people about what they want, what they're doing. They, especially Latinas, get activated because like we move in groups um, and so, to see that happen makes you realize 
you are constantly part of this ecosystem and the conversations you're having, the questions you're asking, the history that you're uncovering and the reports and also the reminders that as Mitra said, centering it on voters, that the power is with the voters. I wanna thank all of you, um, Solomon Jones from WRD and Michelle Garcia from Palabra and my uh, co-pilot Mitra Kalida from Epicenter and URL Media. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. And I think that the, the ultimate thing is to strengthen BIPOC media so that we can keep telling these stories, keep uh, advancing and, and centering our narratives at the forefront. So thank you all so much for your time. And um, we look forward to a very vigorous, vigorous uh, 2022. Thank you all. Thank you. Sarah. Sarah and Mitra, that was such a sobering conversation. The question of timing of two Americas, probably more than two, of apathy being a wrong word for neglect, so much there that I want to see picked up in our media. Just on the timing front, there were two sort of horrendous parts of the timing of the Senate defeat of the filibuster change that would have permitted a vote on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The timing on that coming just days after the Dr. King holiday, do you think that was intentional? Um, I don't know if it's intentional, but I think that it's, uh, it's prescient. It's, uh, it's, it makes incredible sense in this country because we are living in such, I guess, hypocritical times. And there's, there's so much, I mean, we didn't really talk about the January 6th you know, all of the, the, the information that's coming out about the January 6th insurrection. So all of this is, is coming together at the same time um, around the King holiday, around the, the launch into the 2022 midterm elections and all of the, the, the questions that are surrounding how are the midterm elections gonna be impacted by COVID-19 and any kind of uh, evolution of the, of the pandemic. So, I mean, I think that we're living just in a very complicated and, um, you know, a, a very difficult time when so much is being, being, uh, is, is intersecting with the, the realities of where we are in America right now. That we've turned voting rights into a Democratic Party issue is appalling to me because you're absolutely right. In the same breath, we can talk about democracy and how it's supposed to work and it's literally crumbling beneath our feet, right? So I think that's absolutely right. And the other element, I think the backdrop of the pandemic, I know I sound like a broken record, yeah. but Martin Luther King's unifying cause was actually the elimination of poverty, yeah. right? And so to, to, I do think there's some intentionality of the timing here where Democrats can kind of just throw their hands up and say, we can't do anything, you see, they're not letting us do anything. And, you know, if not this crisis, when on earth can there be action? And the action needs to be local. I mean, the point about the laws that are getting passed in the states is they're getting passed in the states, up to and including the laws that will enable um, partisan entities interfere in the results of presidential elections and others besides. And yet our media, most of it, the white money media, focuses on Washington. As you know, that's not where the power is. That's not where the stories are even. Um, so I thank you and everybody in URL media. Sarah, do you want to take us out. It's been a wonderful way to kick off the year and congratulations on your first at URL. I just wanted to add, you know, you, you can't, when you think about what Dr. King and John Lewis and, you know, all of the, the people who were at the forefront of the civil rights movement, we can't assume that what we're facing right now is any worse or more difficult. And they were able to overcome, they were able to manifest as a, um, legislation that began to level the playing field, began to create more of a true democracy. So I think that we also have to 
be um, heartened by the, the organizing and the efforts that, that laid the groundwork for what we need to do right here, right now. Do we have the, the will? Do we have the motivation to pick up that mantle and do the work right now? Because it was done before, it can be done again. I detect the two of you switching places on the question of optimism, hope, and uplift. <laughs> and I look forward to that continuing, uh, at least for you to keep changing places on these questions uh, as the year goes forward. Thank you so much once again for bringing such a great roundtable to The Laura Flanders Show. You've been watching Meet the BIPOC Press with our colleagues at URL Media. There's more information at our website. Thanks for joining us. 